Hello everybody and welcome. On March 3rd, 2021, we experienced something extraordinary. A rocket the size of the Leaning Tower of Pisa falling from the sky, flipping vertically and touching down safely on the ground. Well, initially, but more on that later. SpaceX has successfully demonstrated their landing maneuver for their Starship vehicle with their most recent test flight of the vehicle called SN10, short for serial number 10. And that was the triumph. The tragedy came minutes later when the vehicle exploded in dramatic fashion. Apparently it got so excited that it wanted to attempt a second test flight. Let's look at this flight and the results in a little more detail and why this marks a few milestones and pointers for further design iterations for SpaceX. One visual difference to the previously launched SN8 and SN9 were the additional heat shield tiles mounted to the hull. There were even ones put on the aerodynamic control surfaces, even though they were on another side than the ones on the main hull. During descent, Starship performed its usual method of throttling down, reducing the number of Raptor engines firing. When it was down to two, there was a noticeable difference in engine exhaust color. One was a little more yellow, while the other was more bluish. There was no apparent effect this had on the vehicle's performance though, at least not as far as we could tell from watching the flight. SpaceX's commentary also remained very positive throughout the flight. In this view provided by the live stream of NASA's spaceflight, you can see how much the Raptor engines are using their thrust vector capability to keep the vehicle stable. Look how far those engine plumes uh, go to the side of each other. But maybe the color and exhaust change had something to do with the abort that happened earlier on that day. Two hours before the actual flight, SN10 already tried to launch and aborted a fraction of a second before liftoff due to something SpaceX CEO Elon Musk called slightly conservative high thrust limit. They changed the limit and tried again, successfully. Basically, they called out SN10 for being a timid little rocket and gave it a stern talking to before trying it again. Another major difference to how SN8 and SN9 attempted their landing was the way the Raptor engines reignited this time around. While the previous attempts saw Starship ignite only two engines and then attempting to land on those, and failing both times, SN10 ignited all three Raptors, performed the flip and then shut down two of its engines to land on only one single Raptor. As far as I heard, this was done to determine which of the engines performed best after reignition and only continue on the most stable one. Nowadays we take engine reignition almost for granted, but let me stress how much of a game changer an engine is that can be reignited so many times. If this would have been a traditional heavy lift vehicle, the first abort would have meant a scrub, since most first stages don't include the capability to reignite. They are just there to throw the rest of the rocket high up into the atmosphere and then crash down. SpaceX, of course, changed its paradigm with the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, both of which can reignite their engines to land back on Earth. But Falcon's Merlin engines still rely on chemicals to ignite, whereas Raptor uses a spark ignition, basically the same thing that is used in combustion engines of cars. And of course, being able to fire a Raptor many times is necessary if Starship is ever to successfully make the journey to Mars and back. And of course, we know this is the intended purpose of this vehicle. Elon Musk initially started all of this by calling it the Interplanetary Transport System. This time around, we also saw the landing legs being deployed. Barely. SN8 and SN9 were too fast for them to release and from the available footage that's out there, here from Lab Padres livestream, you can see that the mechanism didn't fully engage. Here's a quick comparison on how it worked on SN5 when it performed its 150 meter test flight. I never was a huge fan of them just flipping down and hoping to latch on. And judging from how SN10 bounced during landing and how much more it resembled the leaning part of the Tower of Pisa after the dust had settled, I would say this landing leg system was not up to the stress experienced during landing a full-size starship. 
Also, the bouncing starship reminded me of how landing gear behaves in Kerbal's space program, which made me chuckle a little, I have to admit. Unfortunately, this was where SpaceX ended their broadcast, but the usual streaming suspects, NASA Spaceflight, Everyday Astronaut, Lab Padre and S Padre, continued to keep their cameras rolling. This gave us then a surprise. SN10 blowing up spectacularly just a few minutes after it had landed. We don't know fully what caused this violent explosion that threw the 50 meter tall starship back in the air, but from the footage available we can see that there were flames after touchdown and some massive venting or propellant leakage. A lonely fire hose tried to cool down the vehicle, but mostly failed to even reach it. And shortly after it stopped spraying water, maybe it ran out, SN10 exploded. From what we can tell by watching the various camera angles, the explosion started in the lower parts of the vehicle. It was so violent that the nose cone part started to crumple before everything completely blew up and Starship was launched again, this time rather uncontrolled. Or how Elon Musk himself phrased it, a honorable discharge. So what can we learn from this in regards to upcoming design iterations of Starship? Apparently the change in landing procedure was a success. Firing three Raptors and then reducing to one resulted in SN10 performing a soft landing right on target. Next up, the current landing leg design is severely flawed. It already didn't handle the force of SN5 and SN6 landing very well and now resulted in SN10 basically having to break with parts of its body. Also, when we think about the surface of other celestial bodies, those usually aren't flat concrete. Starship will have to be able to compensate for this with more sophisticated landing gear that can spread the load better across maybe an even wider surface. Just look at how wide Falcon 9's base is when the landing gear is deployed. Starship might get landing gear going into a similar direction in the future. And SpaceX definitely needs to improve their fire suppression system. This tiny little fire hose, well tiny in comparison to Starship, looked rather pathetic trying to save SN10. Yes, the vehicle landed a bit off from center, but there still should be something in place to account for that. It is not clear if a better fire suppression system would have been able to save SN10, but one thing is clear, the current one did not do much to improve the situation. Of course, these are just my observation. Did I miss something? Did you see or hear anything during the broadcast that was of relevance to an upcoming test flight? Are you of a different opinion than I am? Let me know in the comments below. But before I finish up, let me talk a little bit about the difference in approach between what SpaceX is doing with Starship and how the space launch system SLS is being built. What we are witnessing here are two completely different paradigms. Not just in what the final product should be, but also how to go about making it. If you have worked in software development for a while, as I have, you may be familiar with the terms waterfall and agile, or more specific, scrum. To make an analogy, SLS is waterfall and Starship is scrum. Waterfall, to put it simply, is the traditional way of doing things. Plan every detail up front, stick rigidly to the specification, and test when everything has been implemented. Scrum, on the other hand, is an iterative approach favoring short iterations, usually a few weeks, each producing what is called a potentially shippable product increment. This makes it a lot easier to react to changes during the development process. The idea is to have fast feedback cycles. In waterfall projects, you have to wait many months until you can test anything. In Scrum, you do so every few weeks. Yes, SLS is already testing the genuine flight article during the, their green run, while Starship is using some crude prototypes in comparison. However, should the green run tests reveal any major flaw, it will be a nightmare to fix. Starship is, as I said, still far from the final product, but they already managed to flight test essential systems, engine performance, aerodynamic stability during ascent and descent, the belly flop maneuver using the flaps to keep it stable, the flight software, and the landing procedure. 
Yes, they now have lost or dismantled basic every iteration of Starship they made, but in the end it will probably still end up being cheaper than building everything to spec and then trying to fix it on the test stand should an issue pop up that was not thought of during the design phase. SpaceX's process keeps them flexible enough, one might say agile, to change based on what they learn through testing. Before this results in a comment war for and against either SLS or Starship, let me stress that I want both to succeed. Humanity needs more heavy lift capability and I welcome every vehicle that can get us closer to the stars. Because that's where our future lies and we should all strive to achieve it together. Anyway, next up is SN11. Let's hope this not only sticks to landing, but also survives to maybe fly again later. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.